Hello interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Today I'm going to attempt some data recovery. Uh, so um, a customer came in with this old Western Digital drive. This is a 250 gigabyte serial ATA drive. Fairly early serial ATA drive. Um, uh, well, not the earliest, but you can tell it's reasonably early because it still actually has uh, a Molex connector on it. So, uh, so yeah, this one's old. It's got some old data on it. Um, and uh, I thought I'd take a swing at this one because I had a I did an assessment of the drive and I spotted a couple of things where I was like, "Ooh, that might be one that I can attempt." So uh, let's get into it. Now I want to preface this video with just a heads up. I'm not a data recovery expert. Um, this should not be taken as a how-to on how to do data recovery. It's also worth noting that um, this fault that I'm going to address and resolve is probably quite a lucky one. The vast majority of hard drive failures are often um, like some kind of mechanical failure in the drive, click of death, that kind of thing. Um, which is a very, very different animal to deal with. So um, if you're looking at this going, I have a failed hard drive, will this work for me? It probably won't, if I'm honest. I'm merely just showcasing just some of the things that can go wrong with the drive. This is similar to uh, another hard drive recovery video I did, which had a bad TVS diode in it. Um, and I've actually encountered that like two or three times. But again, based on the number of failed hard drives I see in my shop, um, actual like DIY fixable faults, very, very few and far between. So like I say, um, I don't do what I would refer to as professional level data recovery. So uh, please don't ask me to save your data. Not It's not my wheelhouse, I'm afraid. Go talk to um, a data recovery specialist um, who is a lot more competent than I am. Anyway, with all of that said, let's take a look at this thing. So when you plug this in, uh, it does not spin up. The computer will detect that something has been detected, but the drive does not audibly spin up. And uh, what actually happened was I, I could smell that there was something not right. I could smell some burning electronics or something burning. And so what I did was I thought, let's take a look at the back, just in case that's a burning TVS diode. And so if we take the back circuit board off of this and this is pretty safe to do on a hard drive um, when you're when you're going if you're going to assess a drive you want to be very careful not to do further damage that might make a specialist's life harder but just taking this board off and inspecting it um, this is pretty safe to do so we can take this board off and firstly I took it off to look for the TVS diodes and I think this drive doesn't have any um, unless I'm just blind and can't see them. But what I did spot was there was a sodding great crater in this chip here. So you can see that black splotch there. And this chip is very obviously the motor drive controller because it has very big traces going to here and this is the power inputs to the motor. So this is obviously why the, uh, why the drive doesn't spin up because this guy is cactus. So I had a chat with um, uh, with a wild floor lamp who is a data recovery specialist, uh, and I said, "Look, I can find one of these chips on eBay. Should I just buy one and try and replace it? You know, this is QFN. I could probably solder that." Um, and he said, "Honestly, you're probably better off replacing the whole board um, because this guy here, U12, this is a ROM chip which is storing all of the data that is unique to this board." So here's the thing, when you have a bad circuit board for a drive, you can't just swap it out with another drive, even if you've got an identical one, because all of the, um, all of the sector allocation and a lot of like uh, what I would refer to as calibration data for the drive is unique per drive, not just per model, per drive. And that calibration data is stored in this ROM chip. On newer drives, I believe it's actually all stored in the controller now. So this is a much more difficult job on newer drives. But for this one, it's on this little ROM chip. Um, so what we can do is if we can find a replacement board, we can transplant this ROM chip over to the other board. So the our donor board then has the calibration data for this drive. And that means we'll probably get a winner. 
So, through the magic of buying another one on eBay, we now have a donor drive. So let me unpackage this. Um, now, again, if you're going to attempt this because you have you do actually have a drive that matches these symptoms, um, then you need to actually check. Uh, just having a just buying a drive of the same model is not a guarantee that it will have exactly the same control board on it. Um, so you need to check the pictures if the picture is of the actual drive that you're purchasing, or as I did, I actually messaged the seller. Um, and I pestered them for information. They were very patient with me because I kept saying, oh, can you check this number? Oh, can you now check this number? And uh, I could tell from their tone that they were not very impressed. So if they happen to see this video, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so what I got here, on the top, it is exactly the same model. So they are both um, serial number, model, there we go. WD2500JS. 75N CB1, but like I say, that's not a guarantee of having the same control board. And the control board numbers are visible here. So in this case, this board is a 2060-701-335-005 Rev A. So it's identical down to the board revision. So this should be chip for chip identical. The only thing it doesn't have is that calibration data on the ROM chip. Um, so, what I should be able to do now, and I've not tested any of this, we're doing it live, uh, I should be able to remove this board and swap over those ROM chips and then put our reconstructed board into the dead drive um, and then this guy should spin up and I should be able to access the data on it. And that will be a nice little fix. So, let's take this guy off. It's a little bit stiff where the board has never been off before. There we go, something's giving. Huh. This one's got a lot of stick to it. Uh, the foam is in much different condition. There we go. All right, that's got a much different foam pad on it. I might try and recover that just because I don't know if it's nicer or not, actually. I, d I don't know what if that makes a difference. I think the foam pad is there to stop condensation getting in or just to dampen noise or something like that. No idea. Anyway, we have a donor board now. And if we check, it is indeed identical down to the chips even the uh, you know the the cash chip everything it's all identical so we're on for a winner uh, and there is our two rom chips so what i'm going to do now i'm going to put this onto a um onto a heat proof mat and we're going to transplant these two two chips this is also a good time to point out that um, um this data recovery job is very much a if you can kind of job um, I'll probably be doing this on the cheap because it's not a mission critical job. Um, so yeah, uh, if you are if you are running a shop and you are entrusted with a drive that has what I would refer to as mission critical data on it, so uh, you know we cannot lose this data. This is uh, the the photographs of a lifetime or something like that. If you're not an expert, my advice is take a pass, pass it to an expert because. While you, it's good to practice and learn on stuff, but when you're dealing with someone's unreplaceable data, that's not the place to be messing around and practicing. Uh, take it from me, I've been there. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, let's start the hot air station up and change my stool for the non-squeaky one. Right, and I'm just going to put a little bit of flux on the pins of this board just to keep those joints nice when we take the chip off and I'll flux up the other board as well so that way I can do all of these at the same time. Right so I'm going to go in with fairly high airflow like about I don't know 75% something like that and I'm going to run 400 degrees indicated which will probably be a little bit lower because my hot air nozzles are crap 
And I'm going to be aiming away from the connector just so we don't damage that. These are nice big uh, SOP 8 packages, so this should be very easy. Whoop, that was very janky. Right, that's one. So that's our good board. And now I could probably just drop this guy right on there right now. However, I'm going to be a good egg and just reflow the pads with some fresh solder just to make sure we get a nice good join. Uh, get some nice leaded solder on there. Um, as I say, because we fluxed, I, this looks entirely unnecessary to me, but... It doesn't cost anything just to touch up these pads and make sure they're in good shape and there's no janky lead-free solder left on there. And I'll just put a little bit of extra flux down. Splat noise. Now I'm going to turn my air down to about 40%. I used to be a bit of a max airflow hero, but I've discovered recently that um, running lower airflow um, can sometimes just make everything a lot more controlled. You might be heating for a little bit longer, but just having less airflow just makes everything feel a lot less hectic especially when you're putting stuff back on the board. Oh, here comes the shaky wrist. There we go, I think that's straight enough and just for good measure I'm just going to touch up those joints again and this could be overkill however because I've done quite a lot of um, because I've done more than a few um, BIOS chips now I have found that even though it might look right just literally just touching the joints with your soldering iron again afterwards is well worth it and just really maximizes your chances of just being one and done. All right, and I'm just gonna put the other chip on here for the time being. I'm just going to tack this on just for the purposes of storage because while this chip doesn't have the information on it we need, it is a known good ROM chip. So just in case we need to do anything else at all, it is here. So now we have our donor board with the correct ROM chip on it. Let's put this in. That goes on like that. Also a friendly reminder, if you're doing data recovery like this, if you've had to do any kind of physical repair to a drive, you should be working on the assumption of data only. Like here, we have no intention of actually saving this drive. So I don't really care what padding I've put in there or if I've, if I've left flux on the board or anything like that. All we care about is getting that data back. Once I've spun this drive up and copied the data off of it, the drive will go into the bin, basically. Don't don't try and reuse repaired drives. You're just asking for trouble at that point. Storage is not expensive. It really isn't. All right. Uh, let's see if it works.
Now for my data recovery setup, I use this USB dock here. It's made by StarTech. I cannot find another one like this, but this is the best USB dock I've ever had with regards to how nicely it handles drives that are just unhappy. Um, the other advantage of plugging into a USB dock for data recovery is we're powering it from a 12 volt power supply. So if there's any catastrophic power issues, we have a limited amount of current that the drive can try and pull. Uh, whereas when you're plugged directly into a PC and you've got a big ass ATX power supply, then the drive can just pull a short circuit. So um, that's why I quite like using these hard drive docks for recovery. So I'm gonna plug this in and I'm gonna turn it on and here we go, crossing fingers. It's spinning. It's spooled up. Will it mount? It has mounted. There we go. Okay, so I've now got Snapshot running on this drive and I'm aware that I should probably be using DD in Lin Arch Linux or something fancy like that. This is why I said I'm not a data recovery expert. However, this is running now. Snapshot is chuntering away. As soon as that bar gets to the other end, then that means we win and the drive is then expendable. So I'm going to leave that to run and then we'll head back to the bench once that's finished. Right, so uh, the snapshot has completed. So what I can do now is I can mount that snapshot that I've just taken, map and explore virtual drive, and this will open the snapshot I've just taken as a virtual drive. So that's now connected and mapped as drive Z or Z. And so now, as you can see, we have the contents of the drive. Um, so uh, I can do I'll can just drill down into some of these folders just to confirm that there is indeed data here. If we go to desktop, there is some stuff. And if I go to documents, there is also just more stuff there. So as you can see, this is a complete 100% successful data recovery at this point. So um, it doesn't matter if the drive survives or not. It's now done its job. We've got the data we win. So um, was I very lucky with this one? Absolutely, I think so. I don't think this is a fix that many people these days are going to be able to encounter. Um, however, I hope you guys found it fairly interesting just as, a, you know, it's another angle where you can approach uh, a stone dead drive. Um, and also like lucky or not, if you don't look for lucky fixes, then you'll never find them. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I've, a lot of videos I've made on this channel where those have been fixes which have been fairly lucky, but also if you know to actually check for it, if you never check for the lucky fixes, then you'll never find them. So just a thought, if you do have an old drive that you need to try and recover data from, uh, uh, it's always worth just taking the board off and just doing a visual inspection to see if you can see anything catastrophically wrong with it. Um, because you might just have something that you could DIY. Um, however, as aforementioned, if it has got the most mission critical of data on it, probably better to leave it to an expert. Anyway, that's my disclaimer done. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.